Shoot. All right. No respect. Sounds like fun, though. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So welcome to today's Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute here at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Today's forum is titled Lawmaking as Public Service and is co-sponsored by the Benyon Center as part of its 35th anniversary. Today, we're joined by some amazing panelists and guests. Representative Jennifer Daly Provo works to serve House District 24, soon to be House District 22, in the Utah House of Representatives. She's also pursuing her PhD in public health at the University of Utah. Her first priority, though, is raising her three daughters with her husband. She is the former executive director of the Utah Academy of Family Physicians in Salt Lake. Additionally, she served pr as primary care and public health functions as the Director of Governmental Affairs and Policy, prioritizing policies for patient access to health care, social determinants of health, air quality, education, and reproductive rights. Representative Steve Elison has represented Sandy in the Utah State Legislature since he was first elected in 2010. Currently, he works as a financial manager for the University of Utah Hospital and Clinics. Representative Elison works on a number of issues facing Utah families. During his tenure in the House, he was focused on he has focused on mental health and suicide prevention, fighting for increased funding, resources, and education for our communities, especially our children. Representative Ellison's public service extends beyond the legislature through his involvement with organizations like the Boy Scouts and the Road Home. Representative Andrew Stoddard was first elected to the State House in 2018, and he's worked in various positions in education and gained experience volunteering and working for agencies dealing with criminal justice including with the Utah Crime Victims Clinic and the Rocky Mountain Innocence Project. He has an extensive record of public service in his community, working in its schools, serving as chair of the Midvale Community Council, and currently working as a Murray City prosecutor. Today's panel will be moderated by Dean McGovern, the executive director of the Benyon Center. I will now turn it over to him to start our conversation, but first, join me in welcoming our guests. Hello. Oh, greetings, everybody. It works. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for taking the time. Um, my name's Dean McGovern. I get to work at the Benyon Center for Community Engagement on campus. Uh, and we are passionate about what these people do every day for a living. Um, I always think that the first part of community engagement uh, and civic engagement is showing up. So thank you for taking the time today. Uh, out of your busy schedules uh, from wherever you came from uh, to spend some time with us today to talk about this important topic. Um, I'll jump right in and I'll ask the panelists to um, explain. Tom Ehrlich, the former president of the uh, University of Indiana, talked about community engagement being the political and non-political acts we do to improve our communities. Um, and I'm going to put that question to our panelists. Uh, maybe we'll start with Jennifer. What does public service and community engagement mean to you? That's a great question. Thank you. And I just want to, first of all, thank you all for being here. I'm super excited that uh, there are as many of you here as there are. And just going to assume it has nothing to do with the pizza and all <laughs> about us. Um, but it is, it's an honor to be here. I am a graduate of the University of Utah and a current student in the University of Utah as I work on my doctorate degree, and I know that you all have a lot going on. It's finals week coming up, and you I know you've got more than just being students on your plates. And so being a part of this discussion, um, it's an honor to have you here to, and to be interested in this topic, because the topic, of course, is public service. And too often, we lose that term, public service, when we're talking about politics. And we all run for office for different reasons, and I'll be the first to admit that however much we try to practice humility, there's a lot of ego that comes, comes into saying, hey, I want you to vote for me, and I want you to send me to the Utah House, to the People's House, to represent you and, and have the honor of um, speaking on behalf of you, being your voice at the Utah House. And so it's, you know, these, 
these public engagement opportunities and your willingness to step up and say, hey, I want to engage with you, my elected official, to talk to you about what's important to me is critical to grounding us as public servants, not as politicians. And so the more that you stay engaged in that conversation, the better we can be at staying focused on why we decided to try to do this job to start with, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Well, that's hard to follow, Jesus. Let's try in the middle next time. Uh, I just want to echo what Representative Daly Provo said. Thank you everyone for showing up here. Um, you know, I uh, come up here and I don't feel like I graduated that long ago, but I don't recognize half the campus, so it apparently was a long time ago. Uh, but I think it's great what you're doing here, and really public service can take so many different forms. Um, you know, we're obviously on a level that's really unique. There's not very many legislators, um, but that's not the end all be all. And I think anyone who takes an active role in trying to make their community a better place, whether that's your community, the city you live in, the neighborhood, whether it's the campus, whether it's just a group of people that you know, trying to get people involved, trying to get people to care about a cause, I think it's just really important. And so I think it's great that you're all here and trying to learn how to do that. Thank you. And Steve. Uh, th thank you. Uh, delighted to be with you here today. Um, <clears throat> in terms of background, I got an undergraduate uh, degree here at the U in accounting and then an MBA. Um, I, my firstborn child was born at the U, and just a few weeks ago, that son just had his firstborn at the University of Utah. <laughs> um, I work for the U, and uh, I probably shouldn't admit this, but back last century, I was the homecoming king once a year, <laughs> one time. So I, I can truly say a Utah man, I am, sir. So, are there pictures here? Uh, no, those are kept okay. completely confidential. So, um, But in terms of public service, let me throw this out there. When I was a student here, I got involved with a number of student groups, uh, Beta Alpha Psi which was an accounting fraternity. You're like, they didn't know such a thing, right? But it's still here. Um, and then I was involved with the Benyon Center and um, ASUU. And that, that cultivated a good um, kind of trajectory for, for public service. A lot of times when people think of public service, they think, well, I have to be elected. Well, the reality is, is that you don't have to wait to run for office to make a difference. And when I started working in uh, my professional life, I got involved with some nonprofits. Um, I got involved with a group called the, the Road Home. It's the state's largest homeless service provider. <clears throat> I think I've been on their board for, I don't know, 15 years now or something like that. And I was actually getting to the end of my term. I served as the board chair. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do next to try to get back to the community? And my representative was having some issues. and. I remember talking to the uh, executive director of the Royal Home. I said, I'm thinking about running for like the House of Representatives. Do you think that's a crazy thing? And uh, he's like, no, I think you should do that. And after I got elected, they decided to extend my term. Um, and so I'm still involved there. But um, look for uh, opportunities to go out and provide public service, get involved. You don't have to wait to get elected. And frankly, your ability to make a difference can start today. So, uh, but obviously you're all here today, so we're kind of preaching to the choir to a degree. So thank you for having us. That's great. Uh, I'm gonna segue off of what you just said, Steve, which I think is fantastic. You do not have to wait to uh, find yourself and in, in get up off the couch or out of your house or apartment and make a difference in the community. So at the Benyon Center, we talk about pathways of community engagement. We talk about po uh, policy and governance, running for office, affecting policy. We talk about direct service, rolling up your sleeves, helping individuals and organizations and causes. We talk about social entrepreneur, entrepreneurism, starting a business with services and opportunities to give back to the community that way. Philanthropy, moving resources from where they are to where they're needed. Um, and activism, community organizing. And also community engaged research and scholarship, providing data that helps advance. What are some of the ways that uh, some of the things that you do outside of your political roles that uh, engage the community or you're engaged in the community. And maybe we'll start in the middle yes. with Andrew. Yes, for it. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, so um, outside, of, I mean, being an elected official is we are full time during the legislative session and during the interim days scattered throughout the year, but we are incredibly busy all the time. So. Um, 
I, I'm sure I speak for the three of us as well as every other elected official here, is that when we fit it in, it's just trying to make it work where we can. Um, one of the things that I know we all try to do is just get the word out, hold town halls, be at different meetings, show up to our community councils. I think it's really important for people to know their elected officials, not just as, oh, this is who my representative is, but this is who my representative is, and I've met them, and I've talked with them, and we've conversed about policy issues. And so it's really important to get to know the people that represent you. And so that's something that at least I try to spend a lot of time with, is getting to know my constituents, getting to know, you know the mayors, the city councils in my district. And that's something that I've tried to do, as well as be supportive of the school district, going to different events. Um, just trying to get the word out there so I can get more people excited about politics. I mean, you look at our voting numbers and they seem great, and then you realize, wow, that many you know, percentage of people who show up to vote is just of the registered voters and not of the people who actually can vote and aren't registered. And, and so just letting people know how they can make a difference, I think, is really important in our role as elected officials. Great. Steve, you want to? Uh, sure. So I, I guess uh, you're asking about outside of our, our roles. It, it does get a little bit difficult given the time constraints. Um, I have stayed involved with, with The Road Home, which has definitely helped keep me connected uh, with that, uh, that issue of homelessness. Uh, just this morning I had a long phone call with the director of The Road Home about issues they're facing. And one example was oh, about a month ago I was learning that family homelessness is becoming a much larger issue with the end of the eviction moratorium and raising rental prices. And a friend said, well, I'm working with this family that's living on the Jordan River. The mother's pregnant and they have young children. And there's, there's no substitute for getting down in the trenches or out on the front lines of whatever issue that you're working on. So I said, would you mind taking me to their camp? So we went down to the Jordan River and it was, um, a very humbling experience to see that this is where you know families that fall through the safety net end up and so kind of back to what I said before if there's a cause that you're particularly passionate about finding out you know what you can do to get involved in reality you might be able to make a bigger difference than if you got elected because once you get elected you get have to get 38 uh, 16, 16 and 1. Those numbers are really 38, excuse me. It's 38. 38. Okay, 38, 16, and 1. Who knows what I'm talking about when I say those numbers? Okay, okay. <laughs> you better, you guys better. That means I need 38 votes in the House, 16 votes in the Senate, and the governor to, to agree to, for a bill some, to pass. And probably some money. And some money. Yeah, that's a whole different story. Yeah. And so your ability to go out and do something, you know, in, in the, the, the nonprofit sector. You don't have to build that kind of uh, agreement to get something done. So, um, yeah, look for a cause and uh, that you're passionate about and get involved. Thanks. Jennifer? So, as a PhD student, um, I'm working on my dissertation and my, my research work centers around uh, disparities in health outcomes for marginalized communities. And I'm really lucky because I've had the opportunity to be very intentional about my career path being closely aligned with what I care about policy-wise. And in my brain, my academic head will never separate from my policy head. Um, my wish is that everybody in the world will be able to find a career path that aligns with you know, those goals for community engagement, for bettering the communities in the world that we live in. And to the extent that you can marry those two things, I have found that personally fulfilling, and I would assume that many others who have that opportunity are able to do the same. So I think that's a great opportunity. And I will say kind of tying back to the earlier question um, about ways to stay engaged, there is a website um, on the Utah State legislature, or not the legislature, but the state website um, called Boards and Commissions, if you Google it. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of boards and commissions in the state of Utah that have vacancies. Um, that need people on them. And when you look at that, what I would encourage you to do is don't, you know, if you're really into hiking or trail development, don't look up the boards on hiking and trail development. Look up the boards that are completely different. You know, broaden your horizons, push your comfort zone a little bit. Because when you do that, when you apply to sit on a board that is not your area of expertise, you bring all of your area of expertise, areas of expertise to that board and that commission. And they are always, there are boards that are commissions that have vacancies that they're actively seeking, people who are willing to give their time and experience and expertise. So 
don't definitely run for office. Consider every I hope every single one of you considers running for office someday. But there are a million, like I said before, there are a lot of ways to make a really important difference in the world. This is one of them. Um, but there are, even as elected officials, we all look for opportunities to make a difference. Sage advice, for sure. Um, thank you all. So back to politics then, in governance and policy making and law making. Uh, there's an ongoing discussion semester after semester with our students about the difference between, you talk about running for office and actually doing the job. They seem like disparate and very different job descriptions. You have to be good at certain things to campaign well and win, and you have to be good at certain other things, perhaps, to uh, govern well. Can you speak to that? Maybe we'll start with Steve. Yes. I, I'm, I'm going to use an example. This politician will remain nameless for purposes of protection. Um, but it was a, a certain mayor that was just elected, uh, I guess, last year. And he told me, and he was, he'd been really involved in political campaigns and party politics. So he's like, I'm going to run for mayor. And he got elected, and he told me, I feel like the dog who just caught the car. <laughs> like, what do I do now? Because I've, I've just been on this one side of it. And running a campaign is about you know, interfacing with people, social media, signs, billboards, messaging, targeting different demographics. It's, it's just a whole science. But when you get elected, I remember when I first got elected, the first day we started voting on bills. And I was like, what's going on? I'm like, you want me to vote on this? I'm like, I don't even, I haven't read the bill. And I'm like, I don't know anything about water policy or, you know, um, public lands, whatever the issue is. And so it is a very stark or, uh, paradigm shift once you get elected. And here's one lesson that I learned very clearly. Um, you've probably heard of Norm Bangeter. If you haven't heard of Norm Bangeter, you've probably heard of Bangeter Highway, um, that big highway on the west side. Well, uh, Norm Bangeter was the Speaker of the House and then was elected governor and served two terms. And uh, he actually lived down the street from me growing up. And so when I first started running uh, for office, I got him to help me. And, he gave me some fabulous advice. He says, Steve, when I first got elected, I thought I knew all the answers. He says, in hindsight, I didn't even know the right questions to ask. And so the one thing I've learned is when I got up to the legislature, you know, on certain issues, I, I thought I knew all the answers. And as I started listening, I mean, in our own world, when you uh, go home tonight, you'll tune into your social media and news channels that probably are aligned with kind of how you view the world. Well, the legislature, you have to sit there and listen to somebody who is, has a different point of view than what you do, and different facts and witnesses. And if you really learn to listen and try to put yourself in their shoes, you, you do start to change. Your views can evolve. And there are some issues that I've done 180 degree you know, turnaround on as I've learned the facts. And so um, if you do get involved, learning how to listen, and exposing yourself to other ideas. Um, one night, uh, I encouraged our current governor to go and be homeless with me. And uh, it was when he was a lieutenant governor, and he agreed to do that. And so it was a cold December night, and we went and slept in the shelter and visited different homeless areas. And it, we got talking. I said, I said, let's play a little game here. Let's see who, what news apps we have on our phones. And we both compared them. And we had a huge variety from different you know, slants. And we both agreed it's good to read different points of view so we can understand the issues and maybe what the truth is. And so those are some of the thoughts on exposing your mind to broader ideas so you can effectively serve. Thank you. Jennifer, you want to take a crack at that? Sure. So one of the interesting things about running for office is that you realize pretty quickly that running for office is about politics and serving in office is about policy. Um, I wanted to run for office because I, I was preceded in office by one of my mentors and heroes in the world. Um, you may have heard of her, Rebecca Chavez Hauk, former representative. If you don't, um, if you ever got a chance to know her, you would admire her as much as I do, I think. Um, but prior to serving as an elected official, I worked at the Capitol in health 
um, health care and public health policy advocacy. And so I think I came into the legislature with a little bit more comfort and knowledge of the process and the people. I had already worked really closely with a lot of legislators, but have always loved the policy. I love the policy um, of state legislative work. I'm, I'm not gonna pull any punches. I hate campaigning. It <laughs> sucks. Like, it, getting out and talking to people is awesome. Like, knocking on the doors, talking to people is wonderful. Um, but the politics and the, and the rhetoric and the, you know, the just trying to be in everybody's face all the time is, is really hard for me personally. That takes me way outside of my comfort zone. Um, it's, but it has, you have to do it because you have to find ways to reach people, especially when people are not as engaged as we want them to be. Or they're so bogged down in all of the rhetoric trying to sort through the noise, what's, you know, what, are the, what, what are the facts and what are the realities. Um, but pivoting from what Steve was saying, you know, we, we are generalists. We know a little bit of the, about a lot of things. We all have our areas of expertise. Um, but when it comes to criminal justice, I depend on Andrew Stoddard for a lot of information because he has a, a legal background that I don't have. And so I would say if you want to be really effective at the policy piece, you find your experts, the people that you trust, and you, you get really, really good at surrounding yourself with really good, really smart people. To that end, each and every one of you has a perfect opportunity to be that resource, that smart person, that subject matter expert for your elected officials. So to the extent that you can reach out to your elected officials, be a resource and say this is what I do academically, these are the jobs that I've had, I want to be here for you to help you with information that you may not already have because there's so much for us to know in such a short period of time. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, so uh, I wanna echo what Jen said, campaigning is the worst. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of criticism, a lot of heat, um, but it's part of the job. So you have to figure out how to do it, otherwise you're not going to get elected. Um, one of the most interesting things, and I'm gonna speak here as, as a Democrat who represents a, a primarily swing district, um, is I go out and I talk about my policies and here's what I'd like to accomplish. Um, and those are very wide and grand in scheme, but I have to live with the reality that I'm not going to accomplish that as a member of a super minority in the legislature. So I think one of the most important things as an elected official, and you know, it's, it's good regardless of whatever your political views are, whatever, party affiliation you have, but is learning to work well with others. Um, policy is really best achieved when there's compromise, when you have differing viewpoints. And I know Steve touched on that as well. Um, make sure you're listening to the voices that you don't agree with because you're going to have a better result. And that's something that we have to work really hard at. You know, we're coming into a legislative session where we have 14 members of our caucus. And you heard the number, we have to get 38 votes to get something out of the House. That means that we have to persuade 24 Republicans at least to side with us. And so we've got to listen to them. We've got to say, what are your concerns with this? You know, how do you feel about this issue? What can we do to get your vote? And we have to negotiate and persuade and compromise. And I think those are just good skills to develop in whatever arena you end up in, because you're going to be dealing with people who have very differing viewpoints, and, and you're always going to learn something in, in talking and working with them. That's a great, great piece of advice and a great segue. Um, speaking of cooperation, collaboration, it's story time. Would you mind sharing a moment in your legislative life of notable collaboration where it seemed to all come together and work? Jennifer? First, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so my very first session, I was first elected in 2018, so my first session was 2019. Um, I had a really great conversation with a, a classmate of mine who had learned that in the state of Utah and in many states, um, birth control was not available as a covered prescription for women who are incarcerated. Um, and I thought, you know, that just seemed nonsensical to me. It was considered a non-essential medication. I thought, well, I know somebody who's going to work up at the Capitol this year. I could probably run that bill. And it seems, and this is, this is where you get caught in the idealism of it. It seems so straightforward. And so I, I ran this bill and my first session, I got an email from a sheriff who I will not name that said, um, 
among other things, if we provide contraceptive medications to women in jails, what's stopping the men in the jails on insisting on erectile dysfunction medication? It's like, okay, this is where we started. <laughs> um, and it took four years to get that passed. I ran it every, uh, every session of, um, that I've been at the Capitol so far. And last year, we passed it as a permanent policy fully funded by the legislature with the full support of every sheriff in the state of Utah. Um, and that's because we took the time, you know, there was a lot of misunderstanding of what contraceptives as a medication are, that they are an essential medication, that they're not something that you can just give or take away um, because there is a constitutional duty, every jail has a constitutional duty to provide inmates with health care. Um, and so it, you know, in, in hindsight, it's still interesting to me that it took four years of educating and conversations to get something that should have been, in my mind, pretty st straightforward and simple. Um, but we got, you know, there, there were a few no votes in the House, but a unanimous vote in the Senate and fully funded. And that was because we took the time to compromise and we figured out the best way to do it. We figured out the best way to fund it. And we educated and we had conversations and community members came to the Capitol and engaged with legislators to explain you know, how important it is that we provide continuity of care, basic health care, to what is, by definition, a marginalized community. Great, thanks. Andrew, you wanna? So, um, I wish Nick was in here, because this is a, a bill I worked on. Uh, he's the one floating around taking yeah. pictures and did the introduction, so. He was my intern, which if you haven't applied to be an intern at the state legislature, please do it. It's a fantastic opportunity, and it's fantastic for us because we need a lot of help in so many different ways. So um, I ran a bill that was a, a committee bill, so it's one that we discussed over the interim period, and it was a tax credit for alternative fuel heavy-duty vehicles. So trucks, tractors, things that used electric fuel, uh, hydrogen combination. Um, basically trying to help clean the air by offering tax incentives. And so this was a bill, we worked really hard, got it passed, got it through the legislature, and then COVID hit, so I get a call from the governor saying, hey, I'm vetoing your bill, which is kind of a cool call to get, but also, you know, it's something that I've been working on for a year, yeah. And uh, so that was hard, so I ran the bill again the next year and got it through, worked hard, and it was great. And then the Senate made some tweaks on it just to dates, nothing big, just, very minimal tweaks. So at that point, it has to come back to the House for a concurring vote. So it comes back for a concurring vote, and I'm watching the board, and I've got like 35 votes. And I'm thinking, this is the same body that has passed this out two weeks earlier. Nothing significantly has changed. It's just minor tweaks. And so I'm looking around thinking, who can I call? And all of a sudden, I look at, there's a group of three Republicans that sit right in front of me, and they look back at me, and they all flip their votes. <laughs> and, and they came up to me after and said, we don't like the bill because we don't like tax credits, but you shouldn't have a bill fail on a technicality because it had to come back. And I thought, wow, this is so wonderful that they were willing to change their votes and kind of go against their policy views just because we had that relationship. And you realize how important relationships are up there, you know, whether it's lobbyists, whether it's fellow lawmakers, constituents, whatever it is, that you know, if you have the trust of the people up there, that, that they'll help you out when they can. So you don't hate each other as much as it looks like during the campaign season? <laughs> no, uh, we, uh, so it's something like 96% of the bills are unanimous or near unanimous. I, I would say it's probably five or six a year that get heated, but you know, we, we hang out regularly. It's so. great to hear. And Steve, do you have a story yeah. of collaboration? Uh, yeah, so since Andrew shared a bipartisan story, I'll do the same thing. Note that there's a super minority of Republicans up here. Which is, that's just the opposite of what it is uh, up on the Hill, but that's okay. It's good for me. Um, so over my 12 years, I've uh, sponsored in some form about 40 bills relating to mental health. And the first bill that I ran, um, I was getting beat up on the floor really hard. A lot of lights were on. This story was in the Desert News, and Speaker Becky Lockhart, late Speaker Lockhart, was at the dais. And she told the story, there was a lot of lights on to speak. And I, I was a new guy, so I was sitting on the very front row, and I just felt like all these eyes were behind me. And anyway, um, a Democrat, Representative Mark Wheatley, stood up 
to speak. Uh, one of the most senior members of the body, probably the most quiet, uh, doesn't speak very often. But, and I, I, you know, I'm thinking, oh man, is he gonna speak against my bill too? And he stood up and gave this beautiful speech. And he says, you know, this bill is really important. He said, mental health's not something we talk a lot about. He says, but I was here at the Capitol one day and my phone rang and they said, you need to get to the hospital because your son attempted suicide and we don't know if he's gonna make it. And he says, I didn't make it to the hospital in time. And Speaker Lockhart said, all the lights went off. And I finished my presentation, the bill passed. And so I was greatly indebted to him because that helped put the trajectory that the legislature in a very bipartisan fashion has moved the needle on mental health like very few states have had, have been able to do. And during the, the right 2019 session, no, it was the 2020 session, I passed a bill, maybe it was 2019, no, it was 2020, um, that it was called HB 32, that dramatic, probably maybe the most important mental health bill we passed, millions of dollars for crisis line, safe UT. Who, who, who's heard of safe UT here? Okay, I wanna ask you for a show of hands if you download it. If not, download safe UT, choose higher education, choose University of Utah, okay? That's, that's a takeaway today to be involved, okay? You can help a friend or yourself. Had funding in there to expand that to higher education, had funding for crisis receiving centers. The bill had passed unanimously. And then COVID hit, and um, that was the only one of only two or three bills that we didn't pull the funding back from during the special session because there was such strong bipartisan support for that. But I'll never forget my friend on the other side of the aisle who who had my back when my own colleagues I didn't so much at the time. So never never underestimate the ability of someone to make a difference. And to the, the point, when you need 38 votes, I've had. Um, bills that wouldn't have passed without the support of Democrats. And obviously it goes the other way sometimes too. So always uh, understand the, the benefit of those personal relationships. So. Thank you, Steve. Wow, that's a powerful story. Um, okay, so be thinking. We've got a group of very smart people here. So all of you be thinking about a question. I'm going to ask one more and then I'm going to open it up uh, to the group. Um, but. We talked about different pathways in which people can get involved in their community, and we're obviously talking to a group of legislators and lawmakers. How can people, specifically students, be part of the lawmaking process? Just that one pathway, that lawmaking, to make our community better, to make our state better and stronger. Uh, how can students get involved in lawmaking right now? Steve, you want to start? Yeah, I, I do. I've got a great story in this area. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little quiz here. How many know who your new state representative will be effective January 1st, 2023? Okay, first step is know who your representative is and then know who your state senator is, okay? And then know how to contact them. And if there's an issue that's important to you, whether it's a bill that's before us or a bill you want to see run, don't be afraid to contact them. So I had a University of Utah student, he was a pharmacy student who lived, actually lived in my district and he contacted me and said, I wanna talk to you about, he came up to the Capitol, sent a note in for me to come out and talk to him, said I live in your district. It, it, you always emphasize, you're a constituent, tell them where you live in the district because we get a flood of emails and phone calls from people who don't live in our district and it's like, if I have time I'll talk to him but generally my job is to represent the people in my district. So he's like, I live in your district and there's a bill, he said the bill number, that I feel really strongly about. And I said, well, that's my bill. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, this bill is about ESPERT. ESPERT is a program where a, a medical provider has a patient that may have a substance use disorder where the physician does, the ESPERT stands for screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. And this was going to expand that program. And he says, well, let me just give you an example. I'm a pharmacy intern. And just this weekend, I was able to use Esper on a patient. He gave me the example. And I was, it was kind of funny because I'm like, well, you know, usually the sponsor votes for their own bill. But he was up there, he was a constituent, he was showing support for it. And I said, hey, could you come to my committee meeting and share this story with the committee? And he says, absolutely, where, where, when and where should I be? So I, you come to this committee on this date. And, and the bill wasn't without controversy. And he came and he shared his story and the bill passed and it's done a lot of great things in the meantime. But he made the effort to learn the issue, share his story and to, to, to show up. The one thing about policymaking is you have to touch people's hearts and minds. 
And he was able to do both from, you know, why this is clinically good, but then could share a story about a patient where it helped them. So that's a great example of a student getting involved. So it has been touched on already. If you have not applied to be an intern through the Hinckley Center, that's a really great opportunity. Um, but something that many people don't know, um, almost every single bill any of us run, 104 legislators, come from other people's ideas. They're people in our community, constituents, people that we work with. Um, we don't just sit in a little vacuum and come up with all these bill ideas all on our own because, I mean, the reality is we don't know what we don't know. And if you have an opportunity to bring your story, your experience, or somebody in your community um, that you know, helping elevate other voices, um, there are, I mean, you all know that there are a lot of voiceless people in this state, in this country, in this world. And to the extent that you can help share your stories or other stories and where a policy change might make a difference, there are a lot of us who want to hear those stories and we want to know how we can make a difference through the legislative process. There are, like I said, there are a million ways to make a difference. This is through the legislative process. This is through changing laws, making laws, repealing bad laws. Um, so, so bring your story, know your legislators, um, and come up with bill ideas. And then there are also, even here at the university, there are a lot of organizations that teach you how to lobby for bills, how to be citizen lobbyists, how to organize stake, how to organize your community, organize stakeholders to come up to the Capitol to tell your stories about why a bill is a good bill or a bill is a bad bill. There are a lot of bad bills that we have to fight off. Um, and that's, I'm, I'm fully aware that's a political statement that is um, unique to each and every one of us in our communities. But you can't move the needle on the conversation if, if, we're, if each and every one of us isn't hearing your voice. And sometimes it's really, really hard. It feels intimidating to go to the Capitol. I've had people ask me if the public is allowed to go to the Capitol because it, it feels so disconnected and, and inaccessible. It is, it's the people's house. It is owned by the people who live here. It's open 365 days a year, although that changed a little bit during COVID. Um, but the, the biggest challenge you'll find to coming to the Capitol is the parking. <laughs> if, you can, if you can overcome that, please, please come be there. Text us, email us. They used to send in notes. Things have changed a little bit. You, you can often zoom in now, though, under you can, and that's that's also true. Zoom since since the pandemic, electronic access has been far more robust, um, and we take public comment on virtually every bill we hear. And so, know that your voice matters. And even if even if it feels scary, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. So, join us. And I'm going to put a plug before I forget off of that. Uh, if you make it up to the Capitol, reach out to your representative or senator beforehand, because there's a good chance they'll bring you on the floor to sit with them. I had someone describe it as both the most exciting and boring thing that they've ever done <laughs> in their life, which is very appropriate. Um, so, uh, sorry, this is gonna end up, there's a point to the story, I promise. Uh, so I first ran, my, my political career started to run for city council. I thought, you know what, I've worked in a city attorney's office. I know the issues the cities face, worked with the city council. So I ran for city council. My, uh, my city councilman had been convicted of robbery, stole some stuff from his neighbor's garage, thought, you know, this isn't who I want representing me. So I ran, there were four of us that ran, and I came in dead last, lost miserably. And then thought, you know, great, I'm going to run for a higher office with more people <laughs> and, you know, lucked out and won. So uh, the person that beat me, who won the city council position, my city councilman, came to me two years ago with a bill idea. He said, hey, we're, I'm in Midvale. He said, we've got a lot of people in Midvale that are getting taken advantage of by scammers. You know, you get things in the mail that, that looks like an official, like, mortgage notice or something like that, and it's not. It's from a company that's just pretending, trying to get your business for something that they don't really need. And so we ran a bill dealing with consumer protection to tighten the laws for people who are bad offenders in this area. And I just, you know, I, I ran it. It's an issue I don't really know much about. He uh, works in the financial industry and so something he was very passionate about, but he came up, talked about it, testified, sent out emails and support. And, you know, however you want to get involved, if you've got five minutes, we'll have you send an email and support. We'll have you show up to testify. Whatever you can give, we will take it because we're there to represent our constituents. And so 
bring us your ideas, bring us your time, and we will treasure it and do the best with it we, that we can. It's a good invitation. What makes you angry? What do you want to change? So, uh, questions from all of you. There's one up here. So in terms of Wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> Sorry, the microphone's coming around. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, demographics, how much would you say that is that plays into to running for office? Because um, just just to kind of put it out there, you I don't I don't mean this in any offensive way, but you are all white, um, and um, I don't know if you're all LDS, but um, that seems to factor in as well. Um, what what would you say? How, how would you say that that factors into kind of running for office and um, kind of appealing to, to, I guess, kind of the people of Utah without kind of alienating them based on your status, if that makes sense, like if, if you weren't LDS, for example? So I'll jump in really quickly. I, um, I represent House District 24, which you're in right now. Thank you. Um, so I represent basically the downtown swath of Salt Lake City from basically 300 West all the way up capturing uh, the University of Utah and the concert portion of Redview Gardens, which of course is the cool half. Um, <laughs> it is one of the most progressive democratic districts in the state of Utah um, and considered to be one of the, one of a few, a handful of districts that I, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say no Republican could ever win. There are many others that, that go the other way. And so for somebody like me, I ran, like I said, the first time in 2018 when my, my predecessor res retired. So I, I didn't challenge a, an incumbent. Um, when she announced that she was retiring, it was a field day for a primary. There were six people who filed to run, four people on the ballot. Um, but by the time the primary was over, like in many, so many districts and on both sides of the aisle, there's, there lacks a distinct competitiveness in the, in the primary, so you're in the general election. And so, um, you know, for me in my primary, it seemed like it was this race to the left, which is hard because there are a lot of Republicans and conservatives who still live in my district who don't want to feel voiceless. And, you know, you want to represent your district to the best of your ability, but at the end of the day, you have to just say honestly, this is my experience, this is what I believe, this is how I plan to, you know, if, if this issue comes up, this is where I stand, but I will always sincere, you know, do my very best to hear what my community has to say. Um, because I don't represent a swing district, I don't often deal with um, a, a really even split on issues. For the most part, my district skews one way or another on issues. The, you know, the, Cottonwood, the Little Cottonwood gondola is a good example that we're dealing with right now if we're gonna, the state's gonna pay for 50, you know, $50 million to send a, my district is decidedly against it, so that's really easy for me. Steve and Andrew both rep represent swing districts, and so their conversations with their um, community is quite different. Um, religion does come up in some districts. It has never come up for me. I rarely have constituents ask me what my religion is. I'll just go on a limb and say I'm drinking a really strong cup of coffee, so if that's a giveaway. Um, but it, it doesn't come up. And it just really depends on, on where you are and, and who you represent. And um, I also feel really strongly about supporting, you know, elevating voices that aren't often at the table. And as a privileged white woman, I'm not a margin, I'm, by most definitions, I'm not a marginalized community. Um, but when my election came around, I, I made, as compelling an argument as I could make, knowing that if I won, it was an opportunity to make a difference. If I didn't win, I would always find an opportunity to make a difference. And it's that, that sincere message that voters have to grapple with. Anyone else want to comment? Um, I'll say that um, I, I think voters, like last election, I, I actually, I don't know, maybe two or three times in seven elections, somebody's asked me my religion. 
it, it's not as big a factor as I think people, you know, think. I think they're more interested in what is what have you done? Why are you running? And what are you campaigning on? And getting those issues out there. I mean, when I first ran, um, I, I had a Republican in my district tell me, "Hey, Steve, I know you work with the Road Home, but I don't think that you should campaign, or I don't think you should even mention your affiliation with homelessness." And when this person told me that, I kind of wanted. Well, I thought something kind of nasty about how I'd respond to that. I'm not going to say what I, I thought, but I'm like, forget it. I'm like, if, if that's part of me, if they don't like that, then so be it. And I campaigned on that, and oh, wow, I won. So, you know, the electorate, it's sometimes hard to figure out which way they're going to go, but I think just letting them know this is why I'm running, and if it's solely on one demographic, that may, whatever that demographic may be, I don't think that's going to resonate as much as maybe an issue or a set of issues. And I just, real quickly, just want to echo, I, I think it's important that regardless of, you know, our status up there, that we're doing the best to, to amplify all voices that we represent in our district. Question back there. Thank you. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation about staying engaged, but I feel like the first step to staying engaged is being informed. And I feel like it's often pretty opaque what's happening over on Capitol Hill, you know, state politics especially. I was a legislative intern this past session and I noticed, wow, the perception of what's actually happening up here and the perception that people have back home, those are two pretty different things. So how would you say, if that's the first step, how do you take that first step? What's the best way to stay informed about what's happening and get an accurate picture? I'll take this one if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the best ways is, I would say, like find as many legislators as you can on social media and follow them. The whole spectrum. I know that most legislators are pretty active with newsletters, on Facebook, Twitter, whatever it may be, and you're gonna get the real story. You know, obviously you'll have to check that based on slant or opinion or anything like that, but you're gonna get a lot of real-time information on what's going on. We have fantastic political reporters in this state and I don't think they get enough press. Uh, ben Winslow, he is up there like 100% of the session. And so that's another one to follow on Twitter because he will give you the breakdown of what's going on, votes, what to look for. Um, zoom in. You know, if you have a few minutes, turn on your laptop, find a committee that sounds interesting, pop in, just observe. Um, you know, it, it takes some time. There's a lot of seemingly boring stuff, but, but it's good just to know the process and how it works, because then you're gonna know on some of the more interesting issues to you, how you can be engaged and how you can respond. Yes. Uh, yeah, just thanks again for being here and taking the time. So you, the three of you are talking about community engagement and doing good through the political system. And I, I think that raises an interesting question of, do you think that the system in which you operate, both campaigning and the politics of it and policy making is optimized, optimized for like causing good and doing good things for the people? Like is that, is, yeah. It's a really good question. Um, I would say that it is absolutely imperfect because there are a lot of people that are still falling through the cracks. Not everybody has, not everybody in our state, in our nation, in our world has their best opportunity to thrive. And it's also really important to recognize that the status quo supports those in power. And to the extent that we continue with the status quo, then it's, it's harder to break down areas where systems of power leave people in, you know, marginalized people continuing to struggle um, with not having what they need to, to thrive and, and to be healthy and to live their greatest life. Um, I, you know, one of the, the best quotes is, democracy is the worst set of system of government except for all the others, you know? Um, I, it sounds trite, but is it a perfect system? It absolutely isn't. Um, are there better ways to do it? I hope so. And we have to, we just need a lot of critical thinkers to, to look at it. 
Um, I hear from constituents and community members a lot that you know things aren't going well, that the system is set up to you know not protect people the way that it does. And you know, as a member of a super minority, I will say that that's a, that's a problem. Um, I have not yet figured out how to address it, but we need really good systems of accountability and voters not being engaged, unfortunately, I think perpetuates the inability to hold you know, people accountable. Um, to that end, I think that, I mean, the reason that I'm a part of this system, that I'm a willing participant as an elected official, I still see so much opportunity to do good. And yes, it's working within the system that we have. Um, I have, I'm not gonna lie, I've got, my kids are 18, 16, and six. Um, but I, you know, I look at my teenagers and the way that they're engaging in the system and their desire to, to create better outcomes. And I have a lot of hope that there are still good opportunities to rethink the system in better ways that I just haven't thought of. I'll just uh, take a uh, crack at that real quick. Interestingly, I think for the past 10 years, Forbes magazine has ranked Utah as the best managed state in the nation. I like to point out that we basically have the shortest legislative session in the nation, and we are a citizen legislature, which means we're not full-time politicians. This is not how we <clears throat> earn our living. Um, we all have to go back to our, our regular jobs and deal with the laws that we pass. And I think that design is, is fabulous. I mean, I talk to legislators in other states, um, and it's basically a full-time job, and their campaigns cost seven figures. And so they're out spending a ton of time fundraising, and sometimes you know, that comes with some strings attached. And in Utah, our races cost a fraction of what they do in other states. So we don't have to spend the time doing that or you know, feel those, kind of, some of those pressures. And so while our system's not perfect, Having had the opportunity to be kind of at the center of it for you know, over a decade, very impressed overall how, how it works. But so much of it is, in, it is critical to citizen engagement. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, so you guys talked um, a lot about bill formation today, and I'm just curious to hear more about that, um, especially with regards to how communities can stay engaged with you. How would you say is the best way to get those ideas for bills to you? And what does the process look like for prioritizing what bills you run in the next session? Go. Okay. Um, so legislators, I think, are all kind of similar. We have, we have some good ideas or some issues we've worked on we're passionate about that we're constantly making tweaks to each year. Uh, we'll have lobbyists bring bills to us, you know, for example, I, I serve on the sentencing commission as, as a legislator, and so they're doing some sex offender registry related bills to update things, and so they brought those to me as a member, you know, not something that I'm familiar with or have worked on, but because I'm a member of that commission. Um, in terms of what we prioritize, I think for most people, it's issues that we've had experience with or that people around us that we care about have had experience with. Um, I worked for a decade as a prosecutor, represented victims of crime. So criminal justice is something that's very important to me, domestic violence. And so whenever I have a chance to work on a domestic violence related issue, that's gonna get like 100% of my attention. If there's an issue that someone asked me to run that I may not be as familiar with, I'm gonna give it my all, but I'm not thinking about it constantly in terms of what am I gonna do with this next session? This, is, this might be something that I work on this year and I'm interested in, but uh, that, that might be it. But um, you know, if a constituent brings us a bill, I think that's, that's the main thing. Everyone's gonna treat that as the most important thing. And you'll hear that regularly. You know, this is a constituent bill because then we know that it's something that real people in our district are having an issue with that needs to be fixed. I'll give you a really quick example. Um, I had a constituent that actually lived down the street from me, never had met him, came to me right after I was first elected and said, hey, I want you to run a bill to, to allow vote by mail in Utah. And he gave me the reasons why. He's like, here's the other states that have done it. Here's how it can increase voter participation. Utah's having a problem with voter participation. He made a very compelling case. So I ran the bill. I was nervous because he's like, the only states that are doing this are democratic states. And I'm like, well, the, the principles are still good principles. So I ran that bill and we got it passed. And now our voter participation has gone way up because of that bill. And, but it was because a constituent came to me with an idea, 
and had done his homework. On the spectrum of good, better, best, it's, I guess it's good to complain. Somebody needs to do something about this issue. But on the better, best, if you can say, here's what I would recommend, here's what other states have done, here's some of the pitfalls you may encounter, here's maybe the middle path that you can get it done. So that's, that's what I would say. Jennifer, final the, words? Sure. The only thing that I would add is, you know, this a, a lot of times can depend on the district that you represent. Um, I do because I, the district that I represent, I push the envelope on some things that we'll call eyebrow raising from time to time. Not because I think that we're going to pass really, you know, fundament, you know, change bills that create fundamental change in a single session, but because... I think that they're real, uh, really important to have a conversation about. And we know, you know, so in my mind, there are two kinds of bills. There's, there are bills that you know you can get passed. It might take a year or two or more, or it's a constant process. Like I do a lot on medical cannabis. This is, we will always have bills on every year. We'll call it the legislator full-time employment plan, right, is our medical cannabis program. And that's, that's because it needs to be. It needs to be responsive to the patient needs and the program. Um, and then there are bills to fix things um, that, that we can all get behind. And then there are bills that we, you know, we have to force important conversations that are meaningful to our community. And so it just kind of depends on where, you're, where you end up on that balance from year to year. Um, some of us are really disciplined about the number of bill files we open. Steve and I are decidedly not disciplined on the number of bill files we open. We don't get paid by the number of bills we, we sponsor don't. or we pass, don't, just for the record. Some of okay. us are just not good at saying no. And <laughs> you know, you, you get a, a finite time window of time to do this work. And we, we all are sincere in our desire to make the most of it. Thank you. And thank you for representing. The, one of the downfalls of representative democracy is that we, the rest of us, can become spectators. And we don't want to do that. We want to stay engaged and involved. But thank you so much, all three of you, for your public service. On behalf of all of us and the university, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Let's, let's give them a round of applause. Good job, you guys.